Admiral Bauer, thank you so much. Good to see you again. Yes. I would like to ask you the first question about the terrible events uh, that happened in Russia on March 22nd. Vladimir Putin is directly uh, accusing Ukraine in this terroristic attack. Do you suspect, do you expect any, um, any steps coming from Moscow uh, in these circumstances? It was uh, to be expected that uh, uh, Russia would try to point uh, and put the blame on, on Ukraine after these attacks. And, uh, but I think there's clear evidence that first um, the US and UK informed Russia actually about a possible um, terrorist attack in Moscow, uh, which should have helped the Russian government to find and prevent, uh, to find the terrorists and to prevent uh, the, the attacks. And secondly, uh, very shortly after the attacks, IS or ISIL, Daesh, uh, claimed the attack. Uh, and I think for Putin that was a surprise uh, because it was sort of the inconvenient truth for him that it wasn't Ukraine and that it was IS. Uh, and, and, and therefore, as a result of his ability to cut off the Russian people from the outside world to a, to a certain extent, he is uh, continuing now this story of, uh, of Ukraine, basically for internal consumption and for uh, reasons of making sure that the Russian society understands that he needs to do more to win the war in Ukraine, which is about mobilization, which is about uh, continued um, efforts for the economy for the Minister of Defense, for the armed forces. And he's now talking about war and no longer about a uh, special operation. Do you think that he would do something in Ukraine? Like when he blames Ukraine, it's impossible to just sit uh, and, and wait for something to happen. Uh, I suspect that he thinks that people are expecting some answers uh, and maybe some uh, punishment. So do, do you think it's going to be even more tough in Ukraine after that? He talked, I think, yesterday about uh, uh, Muslim radicals or uh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. talked about the fact that it... Uh, so it was not going away entirely from this Ukraine uh, blaming, but it was also recognizing that the people who conducted the, the attacks were actually uh, extremists uh, from, uh, with a Muslim uh, uh, faith. So um, I think he is sort of struggling now uh, how, to, how, to, how to sell the story uh, because it doesn't fit in the frame entirely. I think that is his problem. Uh, is it possible that it will have repercussions for Ukraine? I think with Putin, we've seen everything is possible. Absolutely. Um, so you have visited Kiev, uh, Ukraine. You have met President Zelensky. Um, you have made some statements there. And I was following this, of course. So uh, what are your main conclusions? And what is the main request coming from President Zelensky to you as representative of NATO? I think... Uh... I knew it in a way, but uh, having visited uh, uh, Kiev and, and Ukraine now, uh, the visit sort of confirmed that Ukraine doesn't lack courage, but they lack ammunition and capabilities. And, uh, and I think that is the main concern. I think uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, government is clear in its requests for weapon systems, for ammunition, uh, because they want to fight, have shown they're able to fight effectively, but they need our help. And for me, that is the big take home after that trip, is uh, that we need to continue to, uh, to help Ukraine and even ramp up the help, the assistance, uh, with a higher production in our industries, in the weapon industry, in the ammunition industry. There is, of course, the discussion on the money that, is, that needs to come to Ukraine from, from, for example, the US. And hopefully that will be resolved soon. Uh, so there is a combination of things. It's money. Uh, President Zelensky also talked about money, interestingly enough, not only ammunition. He also talked about uh, uh, their ability to uh, produce things in Ukraine, but he needs uh, financial support for that production because uh, Ukraine at the moment for all understandable reasons, is lacking the funds to do that. So I think there is a, an opportunity for nations uh, to help Ukraine with other things than ammunition and weapon systems, mm -hmm. because 
money is also uh, one of the things that the government asks for. Of course. Uh, did he ask for the manpower? Uh, did he ask for the troops on the ground? Actually, no. No. Uh, and he was clear uh, after Macron talked about this as well in his public statements. He said, we don't want uh, French soldiers to die in Ukraine. He, uh, I think the president has been consistent there and uh, he has never asked for soldiers. He has asked for capabilities, weapon systems, ammunition, and now also money. So uh, there's many ways we, uh, we can and have to support Ukraine because if, uh, I mean, for, for, for Russia, this is, there's much more they want to achieve than, than taking Ukraine. For Russia, there is a larger ambition. And therefore, if they would win the war in, Uk in Ukraine, it is not over. Uh, of course, we cannot allow Russia to win in, in, in Ukraine, because this is making sure that a sovereign nation that has been attacked, which internationally recognized borders have been violated, uh, uh, that the perpetrator, in this case Russia, cannot get away with that. So you're saying that uh, Russia ha has um, not win this war. But do, do you think that Ukraine has still an opportunity and possibility? There isn't a possibility for Ukraine to win. Yes. Uh, and I think we have been overly optimistic in 2023 when we supported uh, uh, the, uh, the efforts of uh, Ukraine with regard to the counteroffensive in the, in the summer, early sp in the spring, early summer. And, um, and we have done that with, uh, we as not NATO, but uh, the 15 nations that support Ukraine have done that through uh, uh, weapon systems, ammunition, training of a Ukrainian soldier in, uh, in, in a lot of nations, um, developing the, the military plans and things like that. So that was done. And then uh, as with many things in our societies, people think if you, if you plan for it, if you, if you, then it will be successful. But the problem in a war is that there's two sides. And uh, if, one, if one side is preparing, the other side is looking at the preparations and is and is, and is trying yeah. to understand what the plans will be and is, will, and is then doing things against it. So it's a continuous battle, not only at the front, but also in the background on what type of weapon systems and the development of drones, things like that. So uh, war is extremely difficult to predict. A lot of people ask me, uh, how long will the war last? I don't know, because it depends on uh, several parties, Ukraine, Russia, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that have, have a stake in it. And so uh, it's not easy. So we have been overly optimistic in 2023. Uh, and then I think we should be extremely careful not to be overly pessimistic in 2024. So when you talk about um, the victory of Ukraine, how do you see it? What is actually this victory? Is it going back to the borders of 1991 or maybe borders of, two, of 2022 um, or any other description? Yeah, first oh. and foremost, I think that is not up to me. <laughs> it is up to Ukraine. But you are the, the main partner of Ukraine and of course it, it depends, I mean a lot depends on you guys. Yeah, so the nations are giving the weapons and the ammunition, not NATO. NATO is providing Ukraine with uh, non-lethal aid. So there's a lot of parties here in the discussion. And therefore, I'm sure that nations talk to Ukraine, uh, not necessarily through uh, NATO, but there's a lot of discussions going on. A lot of nations are helping Ukraine. Uh, a lot of nations, uh, all of us try to understand. I think that is, that is a change from the beginning, what Ukraine wants to achieve. And then if we understand together what Ukraine wants to achieve, like with the counteroffensive, then you can help more effectively. That's Obviously. better than a list, give me this, and then I, I, do my I, I do my job. But as I understand, Ukraine uh, wants to achieve this uh, uh, status, quo, status quo of 1991. Uh, as far as I have understood so far, and, and I haven't heard anything else, is that Ukraine wants to uh, regain all the territory within its legal borders. And this is I 1991. Think, and that is, of course, a... Uh, that is a uh, <laughs> That is, that, is a, that is an understandable uh, uh, wish of, of Ukraine. So it's possible? I think it is possible, but uh, it won't be easy. And it might take uh, uh, more time than a lot of people uh, want. Uh, because that's the other thing that you, uh, I, if, you, if you read the papers, if you listen to the, to the news shows, 
everybody wants the war to, to be over. Everybody wants the war to not be long. And again, it's very difficult to predict the duration of a war because two nations are in it. Uh, the Russians have not achieved any of their strategic goals, not any, and therefore the Russians are continuing, and therefore Ukraine actually doesn't have a choice, because if Russia stops the war today and go home, the Russians, then the war is over. If Ukraine stops the war today, they have lost their country. So there is no, it's not, a, it's not an equal uh, discussion. So if, if, if the Russians would stop, the war is over, but the Russians are continuing the war, so the Ukrainians have to continue the war. When you talk about uh, so many people wanting this war to stop, and I can see it, I can feel this attitude, this fatigue. Um, do you think that there is an opportunity, a possibility of the agreement, some kind of agreement? You have talked to Zelensky. Um, is he ready for any kind of negotiations and maybe any kind of deal with the Russians? Uh, to be honest, we haven't talked about that. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's not my place to talk to the president of uh, Ukraine on, uh, on whether he wants to uh, uh, accept any sort of peace deal, which is not on the table, that's one. Uh, secondly, I think uh, as long as Russia is, uh, is doing what it's doing, they have no other choice than to fight on. But does Russia want this agreement? Do you think... Uh, they Putin... talk about it from time to time. Yeah. But uh, Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainian government, and, I, and I, 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 I actually sort of understand the reasoning, is they say if we have a, a ceasefire, the only thing the Russians will do is use that to become stronger and then continue. So for us, the ceasefire is not a true ceasefire. It is uh, it's allowing the Russians to continue the war after a while a little bit stronger. And therefore, we're not going along with that. And you see the threat coming from Russia um, in terms of the you know, wider war, bigger war in Europe, for example? You, obviously, you have heard these conversations and um, discussions about Vladimir yeah, we Putin's know, plans, we know, like Moldova or Baltic states. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about nations because that's not uh, helpful. Yeah. Um, but uh, we know the ambitions of the Russians uh, are larger than Ukraine. And uh, they want to go back to borders uh, that are part of their past. And, 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 and that now basically um, is about nations that are sovereign states, uh, no longer part of the Soviet Union. And therefore, uh, they don't have a say in it anymore. Uh, and, and that is what they try to, to, uh, to fight, basically. But they do not agree what happened in the 90s, that uh, the Soviet Union broke up. And uh, now a number, a lot of nations are actually sovereign states and decide for themselves what they do and how they see their future and their alliances. But Vladimir Putin wants his empire uh, to be rebuilt, uh, right? And this, in these circumstances, do you think that there is a necessity, for example, of, you know, uh, wartime economy for Europe, uh, for changing the rules of the game, uh, changing the rules of living? Um, in the European Union, because uh, if there is a threat of Vladimir Putin coming with his army, if this is serious, uh, you, two, need, you need so to be prepared. So it's two things. There is no immediate threat uh -huh. against NATO nations. There's no, uh, there's no indications that NATO nations, who, whomever, uh -huh. is going to be attacked by Russia uh, in the near future. That is one. Uh, second, the ambitions of Russia are larger than, than Ukraine. That's also what we know. So therefore, we have to be prepared to defend ourselves better than we, than we were able to do in the past. Third, uh, we see that the Russians uh, are now increasing their defense production faster than we thought possible, uh, especially when it comes to artillery grenades and missiles. And therefore, that has a negative effect, of course, for Ukraine, because the Russians have more artillery. Uh, the Russians are able to fire more missiles into Ukraine. And at the same time, in the Western world, the 50 nations, which is not only uh, the West, but it's also uh, nations in, in Asia and some nations in Africa, uh, those nations uh, have a, a discussion within their own nations that are we giving away more of what we have in stock, for example, on top of uh, increasing the production cap uh, capacity in the industry. 
And the discussions in a democracy always take longer than in an autocracy. Of course, that in, is Russia, the, in Russia, everything is decided just yes. like that. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, uh, it, it sometimes uh, might look appealing uh, if, you, if you look at it uh, to, 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 to solve a problem fast. But at the same time, I think the, the power of, of our democracies is that once we have agreed to do this, then the majority of the people understand the priorities and understand why it is necessary and therefore are able to continue to do this longer than in an autocracy. So we, 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 we need more time to convince people to explain things. But once it is starting to move and we now see that, we now see that the production is going to be increased, still a little bit too slow, but it is starting to happen, then I think it can go faster and faster and faster. Um, would you agree that there is a stalemate on the front? There's not a lot of movement. Uh, there, is, there is fighting. Uh, the Russians are trying very hard. Uh, they, they took uh, Atvika uh, uh, recently. Uh, they sell it as a huge victory, as they did with Bakhmut. Uh, if, you, if you see the uh, amount of uh, uh, soldiers killed in those battles, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and uh, the willingness uh, in Russia to uh, sacrifice their military is, uh, is, is for a lot of people beyond comprehension. But uh, it is happening. It is a reality. If you also speak to the Ukrainians, then, uh, then they tell you. The Russians leave the, the bodies of their soldiers on the battlefield without taking them away and, and making sure they get home. So uh, in many ways, uh, the Russians are doing things that a lot of people do not uh, believe sometimes even, but it is happening. And I think uh, that despite their efforts, there's not a lot of uh, movement, there's not, there's not large breakthroughs uh, at the front. So both uh, sides need time to find more people, to find more ammunition, to find more weapon systems, to train and to prepare for either an offensive or a counteroffensive, and both sides I'm sure are thinking about this. But uh, when you uh, think about Russian capabilities, the capabilities of Russian army, do you think that they, okay, if, if not NATO member countries, but do they have an opportunity to go to Moldova, for example? This is the country which is, um, you, you know, described as one of the targets uh, of Vladimir Putin. Do you expect things like that? Because, you know, sometimes you just don't understand whether uh, he has... Um, enough ammunition, enough troops, enough, enough tanks, people, and so on and so forth, uh, to do something beyond Ukraine? I think it's going to be extremely difficult for him. I mean, he might do things in other nations, but it's more hybrid, small actions. But a true invasion in another nation is going to be very difficult, I think, because he needs all the military and all the equipment uh, in Ukraine. Because uh, otherwise, if, if he takes uh, people and, and, and capabilities out of Ukraine, the Ukrainians will take advantage of it. So, um, and as the but front is... But he has is, a lot. He can call for mobilization. He yeah, can but get still, more and more. Uh, uh, it's, not, it's not just uh, numbers. Eh? You also have to train people. You have to make sure they understand how they have to fight. Uh, an invasion is, is not a simple thing. If you look at Moldova, for example, they do not border Moldova, so they have to go through the air into Moldova, through Ukrainian airspace. So it's not going to be necessarily easy, uh, but I would expect earlier things like hybrid actions from, from Russia than a full-fledged invasion. In Belgorod region, for example, we can see that there is war actually going on on the territory of Russian Federation. Now, we have heard rumors about the attitude of NATO member countries that Europeans do not like what's happening and that they have not given the green light to President Zelensky for what is going on on Russian territory. Um, how would you describe this? Uh, and and w would, you, um, would you say that you understand why the war is going on on the territory of Russian Federation right now? Uh, I think uh, Deputy Prime Minister Stefanisha was was very clear on, on this. I think uh, she said uh, logistic uh, targets are legitimate, which is, for example, uh, oil refineries, is uh, logistic depots, uh, 
places where weapons uh, and ammunitions are stored. Uh, if, even if they're in Russia, they are legitimate military targets when you are at war with the nation. And uh, because it, if you attack them, if you attack these targets, then the ability of the Russians to, uh, to be effective in, in, in Ukraine, in occupied Ukraine, is, uh, is hampered. So I think uh, that is a legitimate target. Uh, I'm not privy to the discussions uh, between nations and President Zelensky or his government about whether or not uh, they should uh, do this, this. So that's not a discussion that is happening through NATO. So I, I don't know. I, I read those things also a little bit in the newspapers, but I'm not part of that discussion. So, but in terms of, uh, if you look at it mil from a military point of view, these are legitimate military but targets. People are dying there too. I'm not getting uh, in any kind of evaluation of this. Um, but you know, Russian propaganda uses this. Yeah, but and, and, and obviously people are dying. The but the funny thing die. is, the funny thing is that whatever you do, yeah. propaganda in Russia will use it in any but, uh, way. In they, any case, they... people die there. Okay, so I mean. Yeah, but people die in Ukraine too. So I think uh, it would be it would be strange to sort of internationally agree to people dying in Ukraine and not people yeah, dying I'm, in I'm Russia just that if, it's not if, just... if it is a legitimate military target. So I'm not saying... Um, uh, 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 so if, if Ukraine is living up to the international humanitarian law in terms of targeting military targets, then I think they have... Um, uh, it's, it's military uh, uh, logical. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the, uh, both nations have to prevent uh, civilian casualties. Always. Always. Um, what does Ukraine need right now to get the breakthrough? Like Vladimir Putin has just mentioned that there is a connection with Ukraine of the terroristic attack because Ukraine didn't have the successful counteroffensive and he has connected this, these dots um, between the terroristic attack in Russia and um, the counteroffensive, which was not very successful, obviously. Um, does Ukraine still have a chance to get this breakthrough, to have this counteroffensive successful? Yeah, but let's when, turn it around. Let's turn it around and look at how successful the Russians are. Ukraine has taken back 50% of its territory that, that the Russians took in the beginning of the war. Ukraine pushed the Russian Navy from, from uh, Sevastopol, pushed them back to the other side of, the, uh, of uh, Crimea. Uh, Ukraine uh, was able, and they did it without a navy, actually. Uh, uh, then Ukraine was able to create a grain corridor uh, from Odessa to uh, Bul uh, Romania, Bulgaria, yeah. Turkey, into the uh, Bosporus and the Turkish Straits without a deal with Russia. Uh, 1.3 million young, talented uh, Russians left the country. A thousand international companies left Russia. So Russia is not doing well at all in this war. And uh, therefore, uh, it's not only that we have to look at, uh, at Ukraine. I think uh, in terms of the sanctions, they bite but are not watertight. So uh, I think there is a discussion now on being more effective with the sanctions so that it hurts more and that all sort of uh, ways around it is, is, is stopped. That is one element that is important, I think, for making sure that Russia continues to be not successful. Uh, on our side, we have to ramp up our defense production. We have to help Ukraine with is there training. Is anything in particular, like should there be Taurus, for example, or it's not so important as they show it? Or maybe there should be, I don't know, F-16 or, or something. Is there one weaponry type of weapons that can no, there's not make one, a difference? There's never one weapon. There's okay, but what it's exactly? Never, there's not a magic F-16 or something. I so, got it. Uh, so it is, it is happening. The F-16s will come. Really? Yes, they will come. But the problem with the F-16s is, uh, it is, or the challenge with the F-16s is that it is a very different weapon system than the MiGs. Mm -hmm. It requires not only the training of pilots and mechanics, but it also requires a logistic chain of sufficient uh, spare parts of weapons for the F-16s, for all these things to make it a success. So if you, if you start flying with the F-16s and you have the pilots and the mechanics and the spare parts, you want to make sure that for a prolonged time, Ukraine can use these planes very 
uh, heavily in terms of many, many flight hours will be flown. When is F-16 coming exactly? Do we know it? The nations that uh, are talking to Ukraine about this, they talk about uh, in the summer that the first F-16s will arrive in Ukraine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so th there's going to be kind of a, a, um, several, several types of weapons coming to Ukraine soon. And are you expecting the different situation in summer, this summer? This is that the last question. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Again, uh, uh -huh. it depends very much on, uh, you know, Ukraine asks the nations and then the nations <clears throat> have to decide whether they want to give it. And I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not going to comment on whether nations should give or... Uh, that is a discussion between the nations that give and, and Ukraine that asks. And it has been the case for the last two years. And in general, I would say, uh, uh, with some delays sometimes, but uh, Ukraine uh, in the end got uh, most of what it has asked for. Uh, would it like more? Yes. Is that understandable? Yes. And do we have to more? Have, do we have to do more? The answer is yes. So we have to continue to help Ukraine with weapons, with ammunition and money. And I think that is the thing we need to do. Thank you very much. Okay. And uh, I, would, I would wish good luck to all the people of goodwill. It is really important these days.